Abandoned Asylum It was a dark and stormy night when Jane and her friends decided to explore the abandoned asylum on the outskirts of town. They had heard the rumors of strange occurrences and ghostly sightings, but they didn't believe in such nonsense. They thought it would be a thrilling and fun adventure. As they entered the decrepit building, they immediately regretted their decision. The air was thick with a musty smell, and the floorboards creaked beneath their feet. They heard strange noises coming from the shadows, and their flashlights flickered. They made their way through the maze of corridors and rooms, laughing nervously at the spooky atmosphere. But as they entered the main hall, the laughter quickly died in their throats. They saw a figure standing at the far end, shrouded in darkness. It beckoned to them with an outstretched hand, beckoning them closer. Jane and her friends tried to run, but their feet felt like lead and they couldn't move. They were paralyzed with fear as the figure stepped out of the shadows and revealed its face. It was a patient who had died at the asylum. His eyes were empty and his skin was rotting away. Ah! He let out a blood-curdling scream and disappeared into the darkness. Jane and her friends were never seen again. Some say they were trapped in the asylum, forever doomed to roam the halls with a ghostly patience. And on stormy nights, if you listen closely, you can hear their screams coming from the abandoned asylum. The Asylum I wake up trying to reconnect my senses. Nauseous and dazed in this unusual morbid setting, I look around and find myself in a hospital bed. There was a distinct heart monitor sound in the atmosphere, but the machine was nowhere to be found. I slowly begin to sit up and hold my forehead. Ow! Oh, what is this? As I winced in sudden pain, I drew my hand in front of me only to find dark carmen painted across the palm of my hand. As I staggered to my feet, the blood was rushing in my head with an incredibly dizzy feeling behind it. I turned around to find a mirror before me and gazed in horror. There is an immense gash on my forehead, and the hospital gown I'm wearing is covered in smudges of my fitful gore. Suddenly, a cold feeling washed the room. I look away from the mirror to see if anything unusual is happening. I turn back to the mirror and see a dark figure quickly brush past me. My heart dropped tremendously. I have to find a way out of here, I thought to myself. I stumble out of the room terrified of what's to come. The flickering lights of the corridor were buzzing in readiness to burst. There was a damp, choking stench enough to fill my lungs with fear. The area looked chaotic and abandoned, as if no one was present in months. There was an exit on both sides of the hall. The dim end or the light end. I walked towards the exit and the light end. The sound of my bare feet pacing on the tile was echoing through the walls. Before I could reach the exit, a wheelchair eerily was pushed before me into the hall. The light in this end began to turn darker. Petrified, I turned around and walked faster towards the other end of the corridor when suddenly there was a terrifyingly deep, creepy sound behind me.
Trembling in fear, I turn around to investigate this horrendous noise. An ambiguous dark figure was following me. I walked faster and faster, but the dark figure was following my pace. The exit felt far away, as if I was never going to reach it. The noise grew louder the faster I ran. The lights rapidly began to flicker. Then in a trice, the lights dimmed away. It was pitch black dark, and the noise stopped. My whole body is paralyzed in fear of what's next to come. The room was cold enough where I could see the exhaustion of my breath. A sickening voice that was close to my ear whispered, Impure souls never escape. Asylum Museum. It was my second week working the night shift as security. The feeling of walking the empty halls alone of a 200-year-old asylum museum was indescribable. As I walk through section A1, I can feel eyes looking upon me with every step I took toward the last stretch of the hall. I checked behind me to make sure everything was sound when I noticed Mrs. Limus, the tour guide, standing alone at the opposite end of the hall. Startled, I walked towards her, asking if she needed any help. As I got closer, she just stood there staring blankly at the janitor's closet, which appeared to be left open. When I got about six rooms away from her, I can hear her sobbing softly, and as I got closer, her sobbing intensified. She turned and disappeared behind the corner. As I made the corner, the death room at the end of section A1 gently closed. Confused about what happened, I decided to let my boss know what happened the next night and was too tired to deal with it myself. I turned to the janitor's closet and closed it. The next night, I asked my boss about Mrs. Limus and told her what happened last night. What do you mean? I attended Mrs. Limus's funeral last week. They said she hung herself in one of the janitor's closets. You okay? Never had I ever felt so unnerved in my life. The Chatterley Asylum. I am a night watchman at the abandoned Chatterley Sanitarium and Criminally Insane Institute. I've worked patrolling the decrepit old property for the last 10 years, and I can honestly tell you it's been one of the easiest jobs one can ask for. Unlike my other peers who patrol and protect old abandoned supposedly haunted buildings who have horrifying stories of encountering violent homeless men or seeing ghosts or coming across satanic cults, I myself have not. I haven't even experienced a break-in. That was until a few hours ago. My shift started like any other. I clocked in and put my lunch in the office refrigerator. I then sat down at my desk and started reading my book before making my first round of the property. Like I said, the job was easy. It consisted mostly of lounging between patrols. The first patrol went smoothly. Besides a few strange noises, nothing was out of the ordinary. But little did I realize how wrong I was about to be. After about an hour, after my first patrol, I sat my book down, even though I was deeply enthralled, and ate my lunch. 
Midway through my meaty burrito, I heard more noises. The sound of shuffling and moving about echoed through the decaying corridors. I stopped chewing and got very quiet, trying to hone in on the noises. I began to make out what sounded to be faint voices in the distance. I became startled. I was supposed to be the only one here. I picked up my cell phone and informed my supervisor of the situation and that the police might have to be called. I then got up from my desk and went to go investigate the noises. As I walked down the old corridor, where they locked up the most violent of patients, I checked inside each cell as I passed. I could see nothing strange or unusual as I shined my flashlight into each room until I reached the cafeteria at the end of the hall. I could see a soft glow through the grime-covered windows on top of the door, and as I got closer, I could swear I heard rhythmic chanting. I got low, and as I reached the window on the door, I heard a blood-curdling scream that almost sent me flying. I wasn't expecting that. My heart was racing at that point. It felt like I was having a damn heart attack. I tried to compose myself, and I peered into the cafeteria window. I was shocked and frightened at the scene that greeted me. There were several individuals in cloaks, surrounding two nude women on the floor. I reached for my phone with my shaking hand and whispered frantically to my supervisor to call the police. Help was on the way, but I couldn't just sit here, hiding behind this door. Those two poor ladies could still be alive and need my help. I reached down to my holster and pulled out my gun. I took a deep breath and entered the room. Kicking in the doors to the cafeteria, I screamed. Nobody move, damn it! Stop what you're doing. The police have been called and are on their way. I began choking on my words as I completed the sentence. The smell in the room hit my sensories. Holy shit, the smell. What the hell is that? My eyes began to water, blinding me for a moment. I raised my gun and screamed, Don't fucking move! While I tried to catch my bearings, the smells that greeted me could only be described as a murder's row of used music festival porta potties, all lined up after the festival's end. All walks of life made their mark inside. It was a bouquet of shit and death wafting all around me. I began to gag again. I was able to compose myself enough to wipe the tears from my eyes, which felt like acid at this point, and the scene in the room froze me in place. Several brown candles adorned a brown-painted pentagram in a circle, and in the center laid the two women, dead. Their anuses had been hollowed out, and jars of their bodily fluids and excrements sat next to their once lively bodies. I tried to hide the tremble in my body, but the death and the horrific smell of a thousand gushing colons was making me weak. I asked, Who are you sick fucks? And what they were doing at my asylum? The shrouded figure in the middle of the group spoke up and lifted his hood. He was an older man, and he informed me in a very stately manner that they were the Stool of Decay, a shit cult that worshipped at the altar of stools above, the demon lord of shit, and all other unholy excrement and they were carrying out a sacrifice to appease their lord and bring him back to our mortal world. I stood there stunned. A shit cult? Really? I've heard of cults, of course, but I didn't know there were shrouded up fuckers out there prancing around covered in shit. I told the group of poo fairies to turn around and place their hands high above their heads and hug the wall. At that point, I was able to get a closer look at everything. The brown-painted pentagram was drawn not in paint, 
but in feces, and there was writing on the walls, written in blood and shit, and it read, For our Lord of shit, our master of stench, the bringer of flies, we offer you these sacrifices so that you may walk this earth once again to unleash your holy sludgery. My God, I thought, what sick fucks. I stood there starting to feel high. Off what others who have stumbled upon a shit cult call the old familiars, shit and funk. I hoped the police would arrive soon. I didn't know how much longer I could last. I was becoming punch drunk off ripe assholes and old decaying peppery chili pots. Just as I was becoming weak, the group started chanting. It was quite eerie, actually. It was not understandable. Definitely a language I've never heard before. Almost reminiscent of the Omen movie Yodeling. I screamed for them to cut that shit out. They did not listen. Instead, they began to wiggle and dance. They moved their bodies like they were trying to work something out. Suddenly, they stopped gyrating and one by one began to squat in unison. What's this? I exclaimed. I stepped back not knowing what to expect. Then, like a chorus of funk, the loudest and moistest of farts expelled from their holes so powerful even, that their shrouds waved in the air as the gas passed through. I was being suffocated, I thought. They're trying to get me to pass out so they can make their escape. I mustered up my second wind, and as I did, I heard a rumbling. The walls began to shake. Oh, great. What the fuck is this? I screamed. A cave-in? Just then the cult leader piped up. No, you silly man. Here comes our lord. Gaze upon his porcelain throne in the corner and wait. I looked over and to my surprise, there was a toilet just sitting in the right side corner of the room. I stood there and waited. I swear the noises emanating from their assholes were getting louder and louder as the noises in the walls got closer and closer. The toilet began to hop and shake, and I could see a brown liquid starting to boil over the lid. The cult members began to wiggle and jiggle once more, and in unison gave one last toot, and up popped stools above, the dark lord of shit. The cult members ushered him in like a chorus of angels playing their butt trumpets. He smirked at me, and sat atop his porcelain throne. He then sharply pointed towards the cult members, and with one collected thrust, they shat on the floor. At this point, I must tell you, my nose was about to fall off. I mean, how much shit can one person ingest in the span of an hour? My old factories were about to shut down and close up shop. Stools above then growled, and pointed in my direction, and ordered me to bow at his fecal magnificence. I was staggered at this point. My head was spinning. It's like I was seeing stars, but they weren't stars, that I was looking at, spinning around my head. They were tiny brown demons with huge asses and green gas emanating from their devilishly plump cheeks. I was grasping for any fresh air I could find. Then stools above chuckled and told me to prepare to experience a hundred years of unholy shit from the asylum's most notorious anuses. As he said those haunting words, I heard a commotion from down the hall from the old maximum security ward. The doors of the cells began to open and shut violently. Then I heard the bursting of pipes followed by the sounds of liquid splashing about. Then stools above said, Behold the chocolatey river of doom and dismay. I hesitantly looked down, and it was a chocolate river pouring into the room and floating on top like canoes riding down the shit rapids. 
were old rusty bedpans that had belonged to the evilest of evil criminals that had ever walked these halls. Even more disturbing was the bedpans were filled with fresh logs, so fresh that you could see the steam rising from them. The Lord of Sphincters then ordered me to behold the river of evil, bask in the ambiance of what this institution's finest has to offer from beyond the grave. Evil haunted spectral shits, I thought. Well, that's a first for me. I didn't know ghosts could shit, but here we are. And they're evil spirits to boot. So I guess you could call them poltershites. I fell to my knees. I could take no more of this parade of funk. Surrounded by the haunted fecals of yesteryear, I succumbed to stools of bubs, warm, squishy embrace. Like a grandmother's inviting hug when you return home for the holidays, I began to get comfortable and relaxed in my new milk chocolatey realm. Just as I was being sucked into the hole of functified eternal servitude, my phone rang, snapping me from my fecal trance. I woke, too, slapping his poo hand away from me. My flight, fight, or shite response must have kicked in, and at that very second, because I pulled out my gun once again and blew away the cult shit members that tried to attack me. I then turned the revolver at Stoolzebub and pulled the trigger, hitting him right between the eyes, which were a couple of kernels of corn. All he did was laugh and motion for the rest of his crap entourage to attack me. I tried firing at the rest of the fecal cult members, but ran out of bullets. I dropped my gun and ran to my office, locking myself in. The walls are closing in. My time is up. They're gassing me out through the vents, with a smell of the swampiest of asses. A collection from the evilest of colons, I was told. I hear them mocking me through the door. I'm suffocating slowly. If anyone finds this recording on my phone, please, please, tell my loved ones I tried, and tell them I love them. The Abandoned Asylum I've always been fascinated by abandoned places the remnants of forgotten lives and memories. So when I heard about the old abandoned asylum on the outskirts of town, I couldn't resist the urge to explore it. I had heard the rumors, of course, the whispers of strange noises and ghostly apparitions, but I didn't believe in such things. I thought it would be an exciting adventure, a chance to see a piece of history up close. But as soon as I stepped through the rusted iron gates, I knew I had made a mistake. The air was thick, with a sense of foreboding, and the creaking of the old wooden floors echoed through the empty halls. The wallpaper was peeling, and cobwebs clung to the corners of the ceiling. But it was the stains on the walls and floor, dried and brown, that truly made my heart race. I tried to shake off the feeling of unease and continued down the hallway, my footsteps ringing out in the silence. The rooms were empty, the furniture long gone, but the atmosphere was suffocating. It was as if the walls were closing in on me, and the whispers of the past were all around me. I was tempted to turn back, but my curiosity got the better of me. I finally came to a large open room with a single rickety chair in the center. I approached it cautiously, and as I reached out to touch the armrest, I heard a voice whisper in my ear. Don't sit. Don't sit. I stumbled back, my heart pounding in my chest, but there was no one there. I knew then that I needed to get out of the asylum, but the door was locked, and the windows were boarded up. I was trapped. 
The whispers grew louder, and I could feel the spirits of the past surrounding me, closing in. I stumbled through the dark, desperate to find a way out, but every door was locked. And then I saw her, the ghost of a young woman with long tangled hair and a sad expression. She reached out to me, beckoning me forward, and I followed her, driven by a desperate need to escape. She led me to a door that was slightly ajar, and I squeezed through it, my heart in my mouth. The ghost was gone, but I was finally free. I stumbled out of the asylum, gasping for air, and collapsed onto the grass. The sun was just beginning to rise, casting a warm glow over the world. But I couldn't shake the feeling that the asylum was still watching me, that the ghosts were still there, waiting for their next victim. I never returned to the asylum, but the memory of that place still haunts me to this day. I know I was lucky to escape, but I can't help wondering about the others who entered that place and never made it out. I can still hear their whispers echoing through the walls, and I can still see the ghostly face of the young woman who saved me. And so, I know that the abandoned asylum will always be a place of fear, of horror, and of death. I put love into every stitch. Knitters, crocheters, weavers, and quilters, and the like, can all identify with the statement, I put love into every stitch. Even something as simple as a scarf shows an intense amount of devotion and time. I crochet and I weave. I've made beautiful gifts for people I love, full of all the care and feelings I have for them. My love in every stitch, just like my mother taught me. I've made things since I was little, starting with chunky dishcloths that my family treated like masterpieces. The first scarf I made was for my Aunt Lydia when she was battling cancer. I vividly remember my garish, scratchy scarf with drop stitches and bits of string poking out around her thin, pale neck on her hospital bed surrounded by the beautiful pieces my family made for her. She made a full recovery and is still cancer-free to this day. Sometimes I wonder if that was the start of all of this, or if it stretches back even further, but I digress. Let me start at the beginning, when I first realized something was up last October. My friend Theodore likes to investigate haunted places. Theo can't placate himself with mere noises or footsteps late at night. No, he must go to abandoned hospitals and asylums to antagonize the ghosts of murderers and torturers. He's a thrill-seeker on a quest for truth, and some of his stories make me feel like I'm going to have a stress-induced heart attack. His biggest ghost hunt was in an old abandoned hospital he managed to get permission to explore right before they tore it down. It was infamous around town for being so scary it drove out a professional ghost hunting crew and Theo was going to spend Halloween night in it with his equally crazy friends. I was terrified both about whatever demons they might encounter and the structural integrity of the building, but tried to play it off as cool when I wrapped the white scarf I had so carefully made around his neck before he left. Their night in the hospital is a story unto itself, but at the end of the night, Theo's friends were covered in bruises and scratches, while Theo himself remained untouched, despite being the driving instigator and agitator. He had kept my white scarf, made with soft, thick wool, wrapped tightly around his neck the whole time. As he told his story, 
with his usual enthusiasm. I couldn't help but think about that. And another incident. I made my friend's newborn son a baby blanket and her a matching shawl. She loved the gifts, enough to wear the shawl and wrap her baby in the blanket one blustery day when they had to make a trip to the grocery store. On the way there, she got sideswiped and spiraled into a three-car wreck. Everyone in the wreck had at minimum massive eternal bleeding, except her and her son, still draped in the yarn I had so carefully linked and twisted together. There have been other, smaller moments that I initially dismissed, but am now starting to reconsider. Tests that people were unsure about, passed with flying colors. Dates and interviews that went smashingly, near misses and almost accidents, all while wearing gloves, hats, scarves, and shawls I had made for birthdays, holidays, and special occasions, stitches overflowing with love and care. My mother always told me that every piece I make should make someone happy, even if it's just myself, with love and care put into every inch of yarn. And if I do that, my work will always turn out like I wanted it to. I think I'm beginning to understand what she meant. Take your curtains away. My house can't have any curtains, nor can I enter a building with one. You see, the reasoning is quite simple. It's because of the monster that's lurking outside, watching my every move. As long as he can see me, he'll be satisfied. For those who are not haunted, I'll sound crazy. Yet I hope that the people here understood me that they wouldn't question my every move, that they would believe me. Sadly, I soon found out that everyone in this city thought of me as a lost cause, as I was arrested and sent to the asylum. I've been screaming, begging, and crying, yet it was to no avail. I was put in a room without windows whatsoever pure solitude. It didn't take long before the black mysterious matter, filled with thousands of eyes, started sliding under the door. Tears escaped my eyes as I realized I lived my last day on earth. The monster swallowed me whole, gaining yet another pair of eyes. So remember, kids, make sure to take your curtains away, or things might go astray. I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to the special friends of the channel for your overwhelming generosity. If you would like to support the channel, the link is below in the description. Also, please send me your stories and poems to duchessofdarkness27 at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram at duchess.ofdarkness and Twitter at duchessofdarkn2. I want to thank all my listeners for your kindness your encouragement, and your support. It means the world to me. Thank you for joining me. Until next time.